Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kirsten Wiley, and I'm here today to introduce and welcome Warren Berger, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Warren is here today to discuss his book, Cad Monkeys, Dinosaur Babies, and T-Shaped People, Inside the World of Design Thinking and How It Can Spark Creativity and Innovation. Great designers have learned to maximize moments of clarity and creativity, turning ideas into innovative new products and social networking tools. Today, the best design thinking is helping to find fresh ideas on how to meet basic human needs in developing countries, and is helping to reinvent social services in general. If you approach entrenched problems with radically fresh insights and solid design principles, you too can create progress. Warren is an award-winning journalist who has written for the New York Times Magazine, GQ, and Wired, and is the author of Advertising Today, Next Phil, and No Opportunity Wasted. He is also the creator of one and acclaimed <laughs> national magazine on advertising and design. Please join me in welcoming him to Microsoft. Thank you. Hi, it's great to be here. So um, this is the cover of the, of the book, as you probably guessed. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll say a few words about that title uh, later on, a little explanation of some of those, those terms. But um, as you can see from the deck, it's mainly about design thinking, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, in working on this book, I, um, I'm not a designer myself, so I'm a journalist, so I was kind of an outsider. Uh, I'm taking a journey into the design world, and um, particularly kind of inside the heads of designers. And um, this guy in particular, inside his head, um, Bruce Mao is a very eclectic designer. I mean, he designed, started as a graphic designer, but he ended up doing uh, all kinds of uh, designing interiors. Uh, he gets involved in the design of, of cities. Um, he basically designs almost everything. And he is a great um, uh, person to study in terms of how he approaches problems and how he uh, takes on design challenges. So he was probably my main guy. Uh, there were lots of others that I'll, I'll, I'll mention a few today. But uh, you know, he was the guy I was kind of, I wanted to focus on what he does in terms of his, his approach to design thinking. I put a little trademark on there because that term is actually becoming almost like a, um, I don't know if people here have noticed, but it's gotten to be a really like a, a popular term in business these days. It's being used a lot. Um, it's a you know Stanford University, Harvard Business School. They've kind of gotten into this. The firm IDEO is promoting design thinking, and it's just really kind of getting around. Uh, but you know, my challenge was first figuring out what it means. You know, because it's a, it's an interesting term. That there's a lot of um, different sort of academic definitions of it, and uh, so when you're trying to figure out what design thinking is, you you end up with uh, definitions like this one. You know, which I, I came from uh, IDEO, which is pretty heavy, heavy going. You know, design thinking is a nonlinear approach to problem solving that integrates what is desirable from a human point of view with what is technologically feasible and economically viable by seeing patterns in the environment and taking a human-centered approach to engage people and address problems. Which you know, by the time you get to the end of that definition, you basically need a cold beer. So I was looking for something a little bit simpler uh, that may be more relatable. And um, after a lot of thinking, I eventually came up with this definition. And you know, that's kind of like, that's kind of what it's all about. Uh, and, and especially in terms of the way I approach design thinking is just trying to figure out how designers approach problems, you know? And do they, do designers in general do that differently from the rest of us? Uh, and do they have some approaches that are kind of unique to them? So that was uh, what, what I was, uh, that was on my, that was my quest to, to sort of understand if and how designers think different and do they have unique ways of solving problems. Um, I, th I think that uh, it, this is kind of useful for everybody, whether you're a designer or not. If you're not a designer, then understanding design thinking can help you start to think like a designer. And there's a lot of good reasons to do that. If you are a designer, 
and you're already thinking like a designer, um, it can be good to be able to articulate what you do, you know, because a lot of designers do certain things, but they don't think about how they do them. They don't think about the steps they go through and the processes and the procedures. So it's good to, even for designers, to understand and analyze their own thinking and be able to talk about it. So uh, in the book, as, as I mentioned, I studied lots of different uh, designers. Um, this is Yves Behar, Brian Collins, uh, Deborah Adler, Stefan Sagmeister, crossing a range of disciplines. Um, uh, you, some of you may know Yves Behar was one of the lead designers on the, the One Laptop Per Child program, but he designs tons of really cool stuff. Um, Deborah Adler uh, redesigned medicine bottles for Target uh, in a really interesting way. Um, Brian Collins does a lot of, just a lot of different kinds of uh, both uh, experiential design. He designs spaces, but he also does graphic design. Uh, designed Al Gore's um, uh, environmental movement uh, kind of logos. Um, Stefan Sagmeister uh, just does a lot of really quirky, interesting design, everything from album covers to interiors. And, uh, but then as I, as I got into it, I kept adding more and more designers <laughs> and talking to, you know, by the time I was done, I'd probably talked to close to 100 designers crossing all kinds of disciplines from, you know, web design to product design to basically everything you can think of. So um, in doing that, you know, one of the things I was trying to do is figure out, well, what do these people have in common, you know? And um, I really started by looking at stories of how they design. You know, and, and that was my starting point. And, and that in the book, there are a lot of stories about how these individual designers solved a problem, a particular problem that they might have been dealing with. Like um, this guy, Van Phillips, uh, designed the cheetah prosthetic foot. So in his case, you know, I, I you know, tracked him down and, and, and found out his story about, which was, uh, he, was a, he was water skiing years ago, and he got uh, sideswiped uh, by a, a boat and the propeller ended up cutting his lower part of his leg off. And uh, he was in the hospital. Um, leaving the hospital, they gave him a prosthetic foot, you know, and he was just really dissatisfied with it. He just said, you know, this thing can't, you know, he, he was an athlete, he wanted to be able to move, and he had this clunky sort of prosthetic foot. So he just said, I need something better than this. And that was the start of his career as a designer, because he had to design it himself. And he ended up designing this, this uh, cheetah prosthetic foot, which has really revolutionized um, the industry. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Deborah Adler redesigned uh, prescription medicine bottles. You know, this is another great story about someone uh, designing a problem, just like Van Phillips, uh, designing a solution to a problem that was in their own lives. Like in her case, um, her grandparents were getting sick because they were taking each other's prescription medicine by accident because the bottles, they couldn't tell them apart. You know, the prescription medicine bottles all look the same. They're in those little brown bottles, and they have the labels that nobody can read. So, uh, so Deborah then took it upon herself to figure out, well, how would you design uh, medicine bottles that are easy to distinguish? Uh, you know, she used these color-coded rings for each member of the family, so you, you can immediately recognize that something is your medicine. Uh, she changed the labels so that they were flat and easy to read instead of going around the bottle. She did all these things that really were designed to... Um, they just made sense, you know, they're the way probably that medicine bottles should have been designed a long time ago, but nobody had done it, nobody had thought about doing that for 50 years. So uh, this is uh, the One Laptop Per Child uh, uh, project, which I talked to Yves Behar about the design of that and how they, you know, the challenges that they had to deal with in terms of designing a, a laptop, uh, and of course this is the more recent, uh, a more recent iteration of it as it started to move into a, a tablet. Uh, form, but um, they just basically had to deal with the issues of, you know, how do you design a, a laptop for kids in, you know, uh, poor villages around the world where they're not going to have the power uh, needs and they're not going to have, and it has to be really cheap and it has to be durable so if it gets dropped on the ground, you know, it, it's not going to break. So the design of that was an interesting challenge and uh, I, I looked at how they did that and uh, they actually did a great job on the, on the product itself. Um, I think in We've all heard probably stories about the One Laptop Per Child program, and, you know, it had mixed results as it got out there in the world. Um, I think that there were issues of, you know, when you create something like that, you design something like that, that's only the first step, because then you have to figure out how do I get it out into the world? How do you deal with the politics involved of, uh, you know, getting this laptop into poor countries and the, 
you know, that, that was a whole other set of issues that they probably were less successful at that, but I think they were very successful at the design itself of the product, and it was a really good product. Um, this is an interesting one. I, I, uh, I came across a guy who, um, he designed something called the Universal Nut Sheller, and a uh, very rudimentary uh, device using a, 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 a cylinder made of concrete and then a, 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 you sort of spin it around. There's another concrete block inside of it. You drop peanuts into it and it, it shells peanuts. And the reason this was really important was because when he was traveling around in Africa, he, would, he went into a couple of the a small, uh, one in particular, small African village and um, you should close that door, yeah. He went into uh, a small African village and he observed that um, the village was like really dependent on the, the, the peanut uh, crop and, and the women in the village were spending their entire day shelling these peanuts by hand and the, he said that it was, it was such an intense job that they were like their fingers were bleeding and, and they still couldn't keep up with the workload, you know. So this device, even though it's really you know, sort of looks very... Uh, you know, very rudimentary, actually changed, it changed the, that village dramatically. And because he designed it in a simple way that could be replicated, it's really, uh, it, it's just made out of concrete and some basic parts that, uh, that other people can design this or, or create other versions of this very easily. So because it could be replicated, uh, people in the village could make additional ones and in other villages people could also uh, make one of these. So it was really a very successful um, uh, thing. So basically, as I was looking at you know, these, um, these different stories of designers creating all these interesting innovations, uh, one of the things I was trying to do is figure out, all right, what do these guys have in common? You know, what, do they have a common approach they go through? Are there things they all do? And to me, that was what I was really zeroed in on. And uh, I came up with um, basically, there's lots of things designers do when they're solving a problem. And it's going to be dependent on whatever it is they're working on or what their discipline is. So you can't necessarily generalize across the board, but I found that there were four things that innovative designers tended to do a lot. They're almost, almost like four characteristics or four steps. Uh, one is that it has to do with questioning. Um, second has to do with caring. The third has to do with connect. And the fourth is commit. Uh, I, I recently wrote about this for the Harvard Business Review, and um, they dubbed this, ended up dubbing this the four phases of design thinking. I don't know if it's like these are the official four phases of design thinking. I just think that these are four things I observed designers doing a lot as they solve really complex and difficult problems. And I'll talk about what I mean by each of those four things um, as, I, as I go into it. Um, but uh, first I want to just uh, mention a few of the uh, sort of the lighter things I observed about designers. Because designers really are, you know, they're like a separate breed of people, even across disciplines. There's some interesting connections between designers. Like, you know, they have their own language, which is, which is really an interesting, um, an interesting language. You know, it's got a lot of really funky and quirky terms. In fact, that title that, that I'm using is, is pulled from my own uh, glossary of, of designer terms, terms that I would hear designers using all the time, which, which I found really fascinating. And I think People love this stuff. They love this terminology, even if they're not designers. They love these, uh, these terms. They're really interesting. Uh, my favorite is chunking, and I also like wayfinding. But uh, I also like forgiveness, which is a really cool design term about building forgiveness into whatever it is you're designing. So you can, so someone, for instance, in the case of the laptop computer for kids, um, they told me that they had to design about four feet's worth of forgiveness into it because kids would tend to drop it four feet. <laughs> they were about four feet high and they would tend to drop it on the ground. So they had to build in enough forgiveness that it could withstand that. It didn't have to withstand a lot more than that. You know, it didn't have to withstand 10 feet drop, but it had to be able to handle that four foot drop. So uh, anyway, I love those terms. Another thing I noticed about designers is that as a, as a species, they're very uh, communal. They tend to get together and huddle together a lot. Um, they probably have more there are probably more design conferences than any other type of conference. I mean, designers just love to come together as a group and share ideas and talk, and which, which I think is really great. Um, uh, they also uh, are competitive, though, and sometimes they can turn against each other. And uh, I, so you, you see that in particular on, um, on design blogs where they will sometimes uh, uh, 
really uh, go after each other and get into some really hot and heavy uh, uh, discussions and arguments about design and the ethics of design and, and that sort of thing. So um, uh, I found that they're also very, uh, you know, this is probably not surprising, but designers are very obsessive about details. It's part of the nature of being a designer that uh, you have to be sort of obsessed with details. And um, it made it sometimes difficult to work with designers uh, as, as I was interviewing them. And uh, they, would, they would be sort of <laughs> obsessed with the details of what I was going to write about them, things like that. But, um, but they also care about important things. Like one, one, one observation I made in, in, in my book is that designers care about everything from the condition of the world. They care about the big issues. But they also care about like the kerning of type, you know. So everything is nothing is either too big for them to care about or too small. Um, and caring is actually one of the uh, one of the big four characteristics that I that I, I put up on the board a minute ago. Uh, that's the second one. But I'll start with the first one, which is questioning. Uh, and I think questioning is yeah, question, care, connect, commit. Question is the first one. Um, because it's sort of the starting point, I, I found for a lot of great design innovations and projects, um, I found that they, it's interesting how many of them start with a designer questioning the reality of, that currently exists and, and asking questions that um, other people don't ask for some reason. You know, it's, like, it's almost as if designers see, designers tend to see reality a little bit differently from the rest, rest of society or the rest of the world. The rest of the world sort of sees reality and thinks that's sort of a fixed condition. And designers see that same reality and think everything in it can be changed. And everything in it can be you know, reinvented or turned upside down. So um, it's an interesting uh, philosophy. And, and uh, it, you know, it, it comes back to their ability to ask stupid questions. You know? um, basically, like the kind of questions that when they get asked, a lot of other people will say, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make sense. Why would, you even, why would you even consider that as a possibility? Because we know that can't be done, and we've been through this already, and so why are you even asking that question? Those are the kind of questions that designers ask a lot. And, um, you know, like Van Phillips, uh, you know, basically, as I said, Van Phillips was uh, questioning the idea of why can't a, uh, a prosthetic foot, you know, be flexible? Uh, related to that, similar to that, I, I also talked to... Um, Dean Kamen was one of the people I, I studied in the book. And, you know, Dean Kamen told me that um, an interesting story about the, this, this creation, the, uh, the iBot. And uh, it, he was, it all started with him seeing uh, a guy in a wheelchair who couldn't get his wheelchair over the curb. And he was just, like, really bothered by that. And it just basically said, you know, in this day and age, why can't we have a wheelchair that can climb up over a curb and climb steps? And that became like an obsession of his to design something like that. So it's just really interesting. The, 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 um, the OXO people who do the, the, uh, you know, the potato peelers and stuff like that, I mean, they sort of started with asking stupid questions like, you know, why doesn't someone make a better potato peeler? And in their, their competitors would never have thought of even asking that because the attitude would be, who cares about a potato peeler? It's like this little $2 thing that, you know, is a metal thing in your hand. Who cares? OXO was willing to ask that question, you know, what if someone made it differently? What if someone actually made a good potato peeler that people actually like to hold? By doing that, they created a huge market for themselves. So just by, you know, I, I, I think it's really interesting how that questioning, that ability to ask that question that no one else is asking um, is often sort of the hallmark of, like, innovative design. Uh, I found that designers... Uh, they tell this joke about themselves. How many designers does it take to change a light bulb? The answer being, does it have to be a light bulb? <laughs> so they will always turn the thing around and, and question the assumption. You know? And that's, that's a sort of a, an interesting, um, interesting characteristic. Uh, this is also common among children. <laughs> so designers are kind of like children in a way. Because you know, kids are, are, uh, are always... Uh, Questioning, right? Kids are always saying, well, why, why do it this way? Why do it that way? And uh, it's, it's very much a, 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 a designer uh, attitude. Um, I came across this clip. I'm, I'm just going to play a, it's like a one-minute clip by a comedian. And uh, he, he was talking about how his daughter does that as well. And uh, his, his young daughter asks those questions all the time. Like, Papa, why can't we go outside? Well, because it's raining. Why? 
Well, water's coming out of the sky. Why? Because it was in a cloud. Why? Well, clouds form when there's vapor. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I don't know. That's, I don't know any more things. Those are all the things I know. Why? Because I'm stupid, okay? I'm stupid. Why? Well, because I didn't pay attention in school, okay? I went to school, but I didn't listen in class. Why? Because I was high all the time. I smoked too much pot. <laughs> Why? Because my parents gave me no guidance. They didn't give a shit. Why? Because they fucked in a car and had me, and they resented me for taking their youth. Why? Because they had bad morals. They just had no compass. Why? Because they had shitty parents. It just keeps going like that. Why? Because fuck it, we're alone in the universe. Nobody gives a shit about us. I'm going to stop here to be polite to you for a second. But this goes on for hours and hours, and it gets so weird and abstract. At the end, it's like, why? Well, because some things are, and some things are not. Why? Well, because things that are not can't be. <laughs> Why? Because then nothing wouldn't be. You can't have fucking nothing isn't. Everything is. Why? Because if nothing wasn't, there'd be fucking all kinds of shit that we don't like giant ants with top hats dancing around. There's no room for all that shit. Why? I'll fuck you. Eat your french fries, you little shit. God damn it. Thank you very much, everybody. So apparently I, at, uh, at the design firm IDEO, they, uh, they have this policy called the five whys. And there, I think there are other companies that have used this too, but they sort of encourage people to um, always step back and ask why in a series of five times. Not quite as many as that, but you know, like a series of five whys. Well, why are we doing it this way? Okay, well, why that? Well, why that? And um, it's, it's kind of interesting. It, it gets at the, uh, the essence of, a lot of times it breaks down something to sort of its, its basic uh, fundamental roots. So, um, you know, that, that, that business of, of challenging, uh, of, of constantly questioning is interesting because I think you can only do that if you're a pretty optimistic person because you have to be um, willing to believe that there's an answer out there otherwise you better not be raising all these questions um, and uh, uh, Bruce Mao uh, has this quote that he likes to use a designer does not have the luxury of cynicism uh, basically designers are hired to solve problems and so they have to believe that there's always a solution and always a better solution. Otherwise, they're in trouble. Uh, nobody wants a cynical designer. Um, and uh, I, I, I was discussing this at one point with the, um, a big design guy. He runs the Rotman School uh, in Toronto. And um, you know, I was basically saying, well, wh why do designers, why are they so optimistic? And why does it seem like designers always believe that they can solve any problem and they can find a better solution than the one that exists already? Um, is that, does that mean they're insane? Or what, what, is that, what is that all about? And he basically said, I had a really nice answer to that. He said that designers and innovators in general, um, successful innovators, they believe they can change reality because they've already done it, like in the past. And so it becomes self-reinforcing. And he referred to this as the upward spiral of problem solving, where the more you solve problems, the more you believe you can, and the better you get at it. And it's kind of an interesting dynamic. But I, I think these, these really successful designers and innovators, they have this level of confidence that's, uh, that really serves them well. And that helps them ask all these questions because they're not afraid to. Um, the second thing, uh, I want to move on to a second characteristic after questioning. So, so you sort of, these people are really good at questioning what, what exists. Um, I also discovered that in the design world, uh, there's a real emphasis on empathy and observing. Uh, and in, in, the, in the book, I refer to this as caring. Uh, designers actually uh, care about um, what's going on in the world around them in a way that is, is interesting and you know, kind of important. It, it connects to their success uh, in, in an important way. Because um, design is kind of rooted in problem solving. But in order to solve problems, you have to first care about the problems in the first place. And you have to care about the people who are having the problems and the nature of the problem. And uh, it, it kind of is, is part of the history of design, really, because I was studying, as I studied 
and look back at the history of design over the years, it's interesting to see how design has been intertwined through the years with all these movements that are very utopian, you know, like, like utopianism, uh, or, you know, modernism, uh, socialism. The designers have been sort of entangled with all of that, uh, with the idea of sort of creating a better world, and how can we make things better, and how can we solve the problems of the world, how can we fix it? So they have this whole history of, of caring about, um, about what's going on in the world around them. Uh, and, but the other reason this is important is just on a basic level, you know, the more you observe people um, and really observe them well, I mean really paying attention to people, uh, the more you see what they lack in their, in their lives, in their daily lives, in their routines, in their work habits, you see what they're missing, right? And then every time you see that, it's a potential opportunity. It's a potential design opportunity because it means there's, a, there's something there that needs to be solved. There's a problem that needs to be solved. Um, and the extent to which designers go around and do this is interesting. I mean, I had, there's, one, uh, there's one design researcher uh, for Nokia who, who says, said this line, I'm like an authorized stalker. And uh, it's because he, their group, their group of design researchers will just follow people around, um, you know, kind of live in their kitchens and do all this stuff just, just to see how people are using their cell phones or whatever it is. They'll just kind of really observe the behaviors of people. Um, in an interesting way, and um, yeah, I, I found this to be pretty, uh, you know, pretty um, interesting to me because I, I used to write a lot about advertising, and in advertising they watch people as well and they study people. Um, you know, they, they use a lot of uh, sort of psychological studying of people and focus groups and so forth. And um, but I, but I, what, the difference to me a profound difference between the way advertising studies people and the way design does has to do with the intentions of the people doing the studying. You know, and I, I was always a little bit put off by the fact that as when I would observe advertising studying people, it's like they were trying to figure out what our weak spots are, you know, our psychological weak spots, so that messages could be targeted at those, at those kind of weak areas. And then when I st studied designers, I found a very different attitude. It's like they were studying people to figure out what was missing in their lives so that they could fill a hole in their lives in terms of giving them something they might really need. So it's a much more positive uh, uh, sort of spin on, uh, on observing people and studying people. And I think it leads to interesting little design innovations as well as big ones. But the little ones can be really interesting. Like uh, I was uh, OXO, oh, I mentioned already, the, the housewares company, that, that's one of the... Uh, companies I studied because they do such great design and uh, they told me that uh, when they were designing a measuring cup they uh, they, they just like would watch people um, they would watch people using a measuring cup in their kitchen and they would just learn these things that you that don't come out in focus groups like if you asked someone in a focus group about measuring cups they would probably say, yeah, my measuring cup's fine, you know, it measures liquid, that's all I want it to do. But when they watched people, they saw that, um, you know, to use a measuring cup, because the measurements were on the side, people always had to bend over sideways and see, the, and it's a real pain. And uh, that's the kind of thing that only comes about through watching people. And then that led them to realize, oh, well, why don't we have the measurements visible from above so that someone doesn't have to bend over and look at the side of the cup to see how much water is in it. So uh, little things like that come out of the, the idea that, that you have to sort of go out into the world and, and watch people, and you have to care enough to do that. And so that was sort of a second revelation to me, the questioning, the caring. And then the uh, third thing that I thought was kind of interesting that I found designers uh, had, a, had a tendency to do is um, what I talk about in the book is connecting. And I'm not talking about connecting socially here. I'm talking about connecting that goes on in your brain, mental connections. Uh, designers are really good at, um, at making interesting mental connections uh, in their minds. And, uh, and, and that connecting, that ability to connect, allows them to come up with really fresh ideas. <clears throat> and I, I was just, the interesting thing is like, why are designers good at that? I think probably other people are good at it too. You know, engineers can be good at it. Lots of people can be good at it. Designers happen to be really good at it. And I started to look at and qu question myself, well, what is it, why are designers good at that? Um, 
what is it that enables them to do that. Uh, that gets into some pretty heavy brain science about how we make connections in our, in our brain and in our subconscious, but basically, um, at the most basic level, what designers and innovators in general do is that they seem to open themselves up to a wide range of possibilities. And uh, most people don't do that. Actually, most people, when they're trying to solve a problem, are really focused and, and looking straight ahead, and they're very logical. And they're also looking in kind of related areas. So let's say if you're an accountant and you're trying to solve a problem, you're going to look at what other accountants are doing. And you're going to read the accountant, accountant magazines, right? What the innovative designers I found is they look all over the place. And they're, look, they're taking ideas really out of left field. And then they're bringing them back into their, you know, their area to try to solve a problem. So going back to Van Phillips who designed the, um, this is sometimes referred to as lateral thinking, right? The ability to sort of, to, to think of ideas, to think sideways, you know, think of ideas that seem to be unrelated and then connect them. Uh, going back to Van Phillips, the guy who designed the prosthetic foot, um, I thought it was, as I was studying his process, it was really interesting because he was making all these unusual connections. Like he was studying um, the way a cheetah, the legs of a cheetah uh, move, the muscles, the way the tendons contract. He became fascinated with that. At the same time, he was studying the dynamics of a, of a diving board, the spring, the spring mechanisms and the spring dynamics of a, of a diving board. And at the same time, he was studying metal in a circular shape. Uh, this all came about because his father, when he was growing up, had an ancient Chinese sword that was C-shaped. And he was kind of fascinated that you could have this really strong metal sword that was in a C-shape. Somehow, he connected all these things. And it, all of these things ended up being hugely uh, important in his final design, which that's Van on the, on the right. Uh, running with the cheetah prosthetic. And this is an Olympic athlete, um, Oscar Pistorius, who used two of these uh, and competed at an Olympic level. But um, again, it's just really interesting, the ability to sort of uh, to pull together these, these uh, unrelated ideas and influences and then figure out how to connect them and make them work. And that seemed to be one of the, um, the hallmarks of the designers I studied. Very good synthesizers. They synthesize the bits and pieces together. Um, this is really important, I think, because anyone who's in the business of innovating or developing something new, I think there's a tendency to think, as human beings, we think that to, to create something new, we have to invent something from scratch. Like that's something that is just, a, you know, a, uh, such a radical departure from anything that exists. And to me, at least, it's, it's liberating to think that a lot of the great creations are actually sort of taking what already exists and putting it together in a, in a, in a fresh new way. Uh, this is the way one designer expressed this to me, that there are no completely original ideas anymore. It's a matter of connecting existing ideas in new ways. And uh, I agree with that. I mean, I think there are probably completely original ideas, but I think more often it's the second thing. And, it's, and that's kind of, that's good. You know, that means that that's more possible. The second thing is more possible than the first, in my mind. Uh, there's another designer in the book who uses this term, smart recombinations, to describe what we're talking about. And really, it's about taking, uh, connecting A plus B and coming up with a brand new C. And uh, in the book, I have lots of stories about people doing that, and including just, you know, everyday designers, people designing small, quirky little things where they put two things together. Uh, I, I came across this woman who, um, who had trouble waking up in the morning. She would she'd basically do, you know, that, that classic thing of her alarm clock would go off and she'd switch it off, go back to sleep. And uh, so she was trying to solve this problem through design and she, uh, she ended up with this thing called the clocky where she, she designed an alarm clock that had wheels on the, on the side of it so that when it would ring and when it would go off in the morning, um, it would roll off the night table and roll away while she was trying to turn it off. And so she would have to get up out of bed to chase after it. And uh, it ended up waking her up. This is now actually a very successful uh, product. It's, and it's in the Museum of Modern Art uh, Design uh, store. But um, it's just really interesting to look at these kind of the ability of design to do these sort of smart recombinations and mashups. And I think that's becoming, that's becoming more important in today's world. I think that we're, you know, we kind of live in a mashup culture. You know, on the internet, mashups are huge. 
And uh, so that ability to figure out how to connect things in interesting ways, um, it's even affecting my field, the book, uh, the book industry, you know, one of the best-selling books, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, you know, <laughs> which is a really interesting smart recombination of Jane Austen and zombies. That you, who would think you could put those two things together and get a bestseller? And uh, now the guy has a sequel, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just uh, uh, an interesting way to approach problems. Um, I did, in analyzing this, I talked to one designer, uh, Stefan Sagmeister, really good uh, graphic designer. And um, he, he's really big on this whole idea of smart recombinations and combining ideas. And I talked to him about how do you do that? I mean, a lot of it does happen in your self-conscious, you know, when you're taking a shower, you know, that sort of the, the connection happens. But he said that he does exercises to, uh, to sort of encourage himself to make uh, mental connections and mental uh, smart recombinations. Like he, he did one while I was with him in his office. He basically said, okay, uh, so let's say I have to design a lamp, okay? And uh, as an exercise, he said, I'm going to take something in this room that I see. And he looked around the room, and there was a picture of a fish. And he said, and now I'm going to work on the possibility of creating a lamp that has something to do with a fish. And he was, went through all these iterations and sketches and stuff. By the time he was done, he actually had something pretty interesting. Um, he said, this is a possibility. I might actually pursue this. But he had something where the scales of the lamp uh, the, the, you know, moved with the heat. And it was a very interesting uh, idea. But it just said, you know, he said he does this kind of thing a lot because it's a good exercise for your brain to realize that you can connect things, you can force your brain to make these kind of random connections, and it can lead to really interesting ideas or take you in an interesting direction. So that ability to do that is, is big for designers. I think it, uh, one reason why designers are also good at that is that they happen to have very uh, eclectic minds. A lot of the designers I interviewed and talked to are people, they're, they're big readers, they're big film goers, they're big, they just absorb, they absorb tons of culture and tons of information. Uh, when I interviewed uh, the designer Paula Cher at Pentagram, her partner is a great designer named Michael Barut. And, uh, oh, uh, that's um, Stefan Sagmeister's work there. He designed uh, Lou Reed uh, album cover. It's pretty cool. But uh, this is a line about Michael Barut, the Pentagram designer. Paula Cher said, his brain is a compendium. He absorbs everything and then uses what he needs at the right moment. And I think that kind of sums up that whole idea of how that, that connection stuff happens. Um, so, so that's the third thing that, that I sort of focused in on. The designers question, they care, they connect. And then there's a fourth thing they do that's kind of interesting, and that is they commit. And um, what I mean by that is, you know, when we... When most of us talk about ideas, we're, we're, it's basically that. It's all talk, right? Uh, and a lot of times the ideas disappear into the, uh, into the, into the atmosphere. Uh, designers, by habit and by training, uh, are, are, um, are conditioned to put their ideas into a form as quickly as possible. So it means that the, sometimes it may be as basic as doing sketching. Um, you know, they, designers are uh, like, a little like compulsive sketchers. And um, if you have a conversation with a designer, which I was doing a lot, interviewing them, they will sketch as you're talking to them. And, and, and in, to try to explain something to you, they will sketch it. Uh, it's almost like it becomes a language to them. But it's more than just a habit. I think it's, um, it's something that is key to their, to their success. Because that ability to sketch ideas and give form to ideas, uh, what it means is you are immediately making an idea real. Uh, instead of just being words, it becomes something people can see. It becomes something that can be passed around. Um, it kind of gives life to ideas. And designers don't just sketch, they build, they, they create these funky little prototypes. They, they may do digital prototypes. They may do uh, prototypes that are made out of uh, cardboard and you know, scotch tape together. They, they'll, they'll make a prototype in any form you can think of. And, I, and they're, they do it quickly and they do it uh, a lot. So they're not holding back. And I think that kind of becomes a key thing that innovators in general or people who want to innovate in general can learn from. If they're not doing it already, they should be doing it. They should be putting their ideas into some type of a form as quickly as possible and then getting those ideas out there circulating, even if it's just to your person in the next office or your friend or whatever. Uh, that is kind of, you know, that's kind of how these things happen. Um, the designer, one of the designers I interviewed in the book, uh, Brian Collins, uh, had this phrase that he liked to use, design is hope made visible. 
And um, he wasn't talking about Bob Hope. I, that was my, my addition to that. But what he means by that line, design is hope made visible, is that design uh, basically, designers have the ability to show us the future. They, they have the ability to show us things that don't exist yet in some kind of a sketch or rudimentary form or a prototype. And by doing that, they're kind of making the future visible. They're making a possibility that doesn't exist yet visible to us. And uh, it's a nice idea. It's a nice thought. And I think um, it's, uh, it's something that, um, you know, probably uh, we all should live by that idea of making hope visible. If we want to, if we want to create change, we have to first make it visible to people. And we have to allow people to be able to touch it and think about it and tinker with it. And um, one of the things that I find about this, when you do this, you have to have uh, a bit of courage. Because again, it's sort of similar to the stupid questions thing. You have to be kind of courageous to ask stupid questions because someone's going to tell you it's a stupid question and you have to be willing to take that right, when they do it. And in the same way, if you do a lot of sketching and prototyping of your ideas, you have to be willing to take the heat of the fact that a lot of prototypes are flawed and they don't, they're, or sketches are rough and the idea is not developed yet. So you're going to, chances are, someone's going to tell you this doesn't work. You know, this prototype doesn't work because I'll tell you why, X, Y, Z, it doesn't work. And that means that, to me, designers have to be really comfortable with accepting failure on a constant basis. And in fact, I, I talk in the book about uh, the art of failing forward. Uh, so it's an attitude uh, that I found is really, really um, strong among designers. And that is basically to not see failure as failure, which is really important. Uh, the good designers I'm talking about, the really innovative ones, they do not see failure as failure. They see it as a step. They see it as part of an iterative process where you each failure sort of teaches you, uh, you know, what works and what doesn't work, and it kind of brings you one step closer to, to a workable solution. Um, uh, that Van Phillips, the uh, the guy who did the prosthetic foot, um, you know, he told me that when he was designing that, he must have done like, I don't know, hundreds of prototypes. I mean, he did so many prototypes of that foot that we saw there, and he would uh, actually go out and run on the prototype himself and it would break. <laughs> you know, every time it would collapse under him and he would fall on the ground and, you know, not a great situation. And um, I said to him, you know, does, isn't that discouraging when you, like, are designing a foot and it falls apart and then you fall down? And his attitude is, no, absolutely not. You know, I totally, that's part of my process. I expect things to break and I, as soon as they break, I figure out what, why they broke. And that's, you know, I thought it was interesting and I think it's something what I've been talking about in the book as I talk to, and as I talk to people about the book in the business world, I've been talking to people about this, that I think in the business world today, uh, all of us, not just designers, but all of us have to become rapid prototypers. Like if you're in any, almost any business you can think of, uh, it seems to be going through a lot of change now. And, and it seems to be, the business world seems to me more than ever before is in kind of an experimental experimental mode, people are having to reinvent what they're doing. They have to figure out how does what I do work in today's climate and, and to, with today's technology. So it becomes this process of reinvention. And it means, it means basically if you're going to be reinventing and innovating, then you have to be comfortable with the prototyping and the failing. Uh, it's, they, the two seem to go hand in hand. Uh, somebody described it as a test and learn environment. That's what we're living in in the business world right now. Everything is test and learn. I think technology people know this already. It's, it's nothing new for technology people, but it's really new for lots of other kinds of businesses. You know, the, the packaged goods businesses or, you know, companies in general, um, I don't think they're used to working that way. I think they're used to uh, developing products and, and perfecting them before they ever show them to the world. And then when they think they've got the thing perfect, they pull back the curtain and show it to the world. But that way probably doesn't work as well now. And I think and now we're in the rapid prototyping uh, uh, model for just about everyone. So uh, just to sum up, the four things that I observe designers doing, uh, they question by asking stupid questions. Um, they care enough to find out what people actually need. They connect ideas that seem unrelated, smart recombinations. And they commit to bringing ideas to life through visualization and prototyping. And part of that is they're willing to fail forward. Um, What's interesting about this, uh, uh, this model, I've been sharing it at various companies, um, GE, Procter & Gamble, a few others. Um, 
it's a pretty simple way to talk about this idea of design thinking that I introduced at the beginning of this, and, which can be a really complicated, jargony uh, idea that no, people have trouble getting their handle around. But I, I find if you break it down into a few, few simple steps, all of a sudden there's some clarity there. Oh, okay, that's what we mean by design thinking. And it, it starts to make a little bit more sense. So this is not the only model, certainly, for design thinking. And uh, if, if you went to IDEO or you went to Stanford University, you would, they would have a different, they would tell you that design thinking is something different from this. But I think this, is a, this captures the essence of it in a sort of a very, very fundamental uh, and easy, accessible way. Um, and I, I think it touches on what a lot of companies are doing right now or having to do. They're having to question, you know, <coughs> the basics. What business are we really in today? You know, what do we have to do to survive? Uh, how do, how do, we have, do we have to reinvent everything? Um, sort of that, that ability to question has never been more important. I think the, the, the ability to care and figure out what people actually need. You know, I don't think companies have the luxury anymore of foisting things on people that they don't actually need and then assuming they can advertise the hell out of it and get you to buy something you, you probably don't really need. I think that's, that's less of a possibility now than it used to be. Um, the ability to connect ideas in fresh ways and then the ability to prototype and, and experiment and fail forward. Um, one of the uh, things I, in the book I looked at uh, a particular project um, that, I, that I found really interesting is the Nike, the Nike Plus system where they connected, um, they connected the, uh, the iPod to the Nike shoe so that runners could uh, keep track of their running, um, their running programs. And it's been, that's been really successful for Nike. Um, it, it, caused their, uh, it caused their market share to just like, their global market share to really jump up. And uh, I found it interesting that, you know, if, if, if you broke down and you, you, you deconstructed the process that led to the Nike Plus, that they went through, um, they went through those, those design thinking steps. I mean, they, they really started by asking some really fundamental, almost stupid questions, like, like what business are we really in, you know? And um, maybe we're not just about sneakers, you know? Maybe we're not just selling footwear. Maybe we're really about something that has to do more with the lifestyle of the customer and, and sort of figuring out what that person really needs um, in a much more holistic way than just a shoemaker would usually think about it. Uh, and then in order to get into that market, they had to do, they had to care. They had to do tremendous ethnography and sort of empathetic research. And I talked to some of the researchers on it and they were, they were just they were going out there in the field and watching how runners track their information and how runners use technology and it became a big part of it. And then in the end, I think they ended up with a smart recombination. You know, they, they ended up with a, uh, an iPod and a, and a chip and a shoe, and uh, that ended up being something that was putting together things that already existed in a, in a new way. So um, I think lots of businesses can sort of learn from this. I think what we're seeing now is business schools like the Harvard uh, Business Program are, are getting into design thinking. Um, they're, they're, they're realizing that, you know, MBA students need to start to think this way a little more, you know, because MBA students have been very... Uh, have been trained to be sort of very analytical and very straight ahead in their approach and they need to sort of adopt some of these ways of thinking. So um, I'm also interested in uh, uh, how this relates to the education world. I've started to think about that a little bit. Um, in other words, you know, design thinking, maybe it's not just important for business students or, or professionals in the business world, but maybe it's important for kids. And, um, there's a number of people looking at this already, and I actually came across an interesting, um, an interesting uh, experiment called the Marshmallow Experiment. And uh, there, was a, there were a couple of designers involved in this, and they, they, they took uh, a bunch of young kids and they gave them uh, spaghetti sticks and string and marshmallow. And um, the, the, the test was they had to build the tallest structure they could uh, uh, without it falling apart in a certain amount of time. Now, the interesting thing was they also did the same test with Harvard MBA graduates. And um, guess who did better? The kids, the kids were, were better. Um, and they were better at experimenting. They were better at, uh, at uh, putting things together. They, they were not afraid to fail. They were not afraid to build something and let it fall down. Uh, so they, were, they actually were better at this while the, uh, the Harvard MBA guys you know, kept arguing about who was in charge of the project and <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, also, what the, one of the people involved said, the, the, the MBA students also, um, they just didn't experiment as much. They, 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 their attitude was, we'll figure it all out before we do anything, and then we'll build it. 
And so what they would do is they'd, they'd figure it all out, they'd build it, and it would fall apart. And then they were out of time. So uh, it's an interesting thing. Um, it's something I'm, I'm probably going to be pursuing in my next book, the value of this way of questioning and experimenting and this kind of stuff as we, uh, in our educational system. Uh, because I think right now we teach kids not to question. Um, basically, our current education system is based on memorizing answers. It's not about asking questions. And uh, so I think it's, and, we, and we're not real big on teaching kids how to prototype and how to, you know, make models of things and try them out and see if they work and then if they break. You know. Instead, we sort of teach kids that the thing, again, it's like business, you know, the thing has to be perfect before you show it to the world. Before you turn in your paper to the teacher, you know, everything better be just right. So I think it's a different way of teaching kids to think, and I, I, I think it's, it's going to be uh, a big issue. I think it's already being talked about. I think it's going to get bigger, especially now that, um, you know, Obama has sort of said, we have to uh, innovate. You know, we have to become an innovation nation, right? That's, so he's basically put out this call to everyone saying, you know, innovate now. And uh, we need to think about what it is that's going to prepare people to do that and what's going to uh, teach kids to think like innovators so that they can do that. And um, so anyway, I, you know, I see it as like, this, this idea of design thinking is crossing over from the business world to education to social problems because you, again, you, you solve social problems using some of these methodologies too. So it leads me to the conclusion that since this affects everyone, then probably every person in the world should buy my book. But, uh, and on, on, on the title of that book, I um, actually started out with a different title, but uh, we, we ended up using this one. And uh, now everyone, everyone seems to be asking me what, about the title because it's got those, those quirky terms in it. So we, uh, we designed a, uh, a little uh, film for my website, which I'll, uh, I'll close with. And this kind of explains the, oh. A lot of designers are T-shaped people, I think. Um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, this is my uh, website, Glimmer site, uh, where if you're interested in the, some of the things I've been talking about and uh, design thinking, what people can learn from the ways designers think, a lot of it is broken down on this site into a lot of shorter articles and shorter bits and uh, kind of interesting. And um, this is basically my contact intro if you ever want to get in touch. And uh, that's about it. And I'd be happy to take any questions anyone has and, uh, or sign books if you, want, if you want to get some books. Yeah. I find it interesting that you come to Microsoft to, uh, where there are many engineers. Yes. And uh, so have you made an effort, like now you go into education, have you done this same study on engineers or are you planning? Uh, I haven't. But I do think that there's a little bit of crossover with designers and engineers. And in fact, I think some of the people that I studied could be considered engineers, like Dean Kamen uh, is probably as much an engineer as he is a designer. And uh, so I think, you know, uh, the terms, there's, there's a fair amount of crossover there. Um, I've heard d designers say uh, that, you know, they think of what they do as on a more creative level than engineering. I mean, they, they, they think of, 
and I don't know how true that is, but they think of engineering as being much more focused on problem solving in a very practical way, and designers see themselves as problem solving, but adding this sort of aesthetic level or this um, artful level that maybe engineers are not as concerned with. That's the distinction they tend to make. I don't know that that's true. I think engineers can be thinking along those lines too. While they're solving a problem, they may also be thinking about how to make it the coolest thing or the best thing possible. So I'm not sure where the line uh, cleanly comes down between the two. But I would, I would say that a number of the people in the book, um, you know, the guy who designed the prosthetic, the prosthetic foot, I mean, he, he's an engineer too. You know? I mean, he's, he's probably both a designer and an engineer. So I, I see a lot of crossover there. And I also see crossover with inventors. You know, like, at, at what point do you call some of these people inventors as opposed to designers? Um, a lot of them are inventors. And you could say anyone who creates something new is an inventor, right? But I, I like to call them designers because I, I just think the term design is more accessible. And um, if, you, if you talk about engineering and inventing, a lot of people are sort of uh, put off by that and feeling it's not accessible to them, that they have to be somebody in a lab coat, you know, to do it. And I think uh, design, everyone thinks they can be a designer. So I wanted the book to, talk, to be accessible to people. And so that's, I think that's also part of why I probably focused more on design. Um, people just loved the idea of design. and People are sort of drawn to design. So, yeah. Why did you change the title from Glimmer? Uh, that was the publisher's idea. They, I think they're going for a sort of a younger demographic now, now that it's out in paperback. And I think they're going for sort of the college market. And they wanted something that was a little funkier, maybe. And they, so they wanted to feature some terms that were sort of quirky terms. And uh, the idea behind Glimmer, though, was um, I actually like Glimmer as a title. And, and that came from uh, I was looking up definitions of design. And on the internet, there was a definition. It was actually anonymous. And it said, uh, design is the glimmer in God's eye. And I, I just thought that was an interesting definition. But I also, it, it kind of got me focused on that word glimmer. And then I think glimmer is an interesting word. Glimmer is about potential. Like when we talk about glimmer, we talk about the glimmer of hope, the glimmer of potential, the glimmer of possibility. And all of that seemed to be line up nicely with design because design is also about you know, what you can do, what, what you might be able to do, or what the possibilities are. So, so I, I kind of took that term and I ran with it. And then in the book, I, you know, I used like, I refer to the designers in the book as the glimmerati, you know, and I, I used it a lot. I talked about glimmer moments, you know, as being the moment when you maybe start to see an idea in your brain, you see this glimmer of an idea. So I, I like the term and I used it a lot, but they just, you know, they ended up feeling like, well, this might be a little bit more catchy with the, with the college crowd. So, yeah. Um, I was wondering if you can explain a little more of how you plan to um, uh, evaluate the value of this, uh, the whole in the, in the education world? Um, I, I'm still sort of thinking about that. The, the first thing I have to do in the next generation of, of this book, uh, which I think I'm going to do if, if I do it, is I, I have to take each of those four steps, the question, care, connect, and commit, and I have to go deeper on each of them. Because right now, it's one thing to say, these are four things to do, these are four good things everyone should do, but I think to really be effective with this, I need to talk about how do you question? How do you get really good at questioning? How do, you, how do you get really good obs at observation? What, is, what are the secrets to it? What, what the people who do it really well, what are they doing? And then, you know, how do you get good at prototyping? What, are the, what can we learn from people who have prototyped all their lives about how to make a prototype really well? So I want to go through each of those four steps. That's part of it. And then part of it is also to talk about, you know, once we understand how these four things are done, can kids learn it as well as as adults, and I'll probably talk to educators about that. I'll talk to people who are involved in the education system and how you reinvent education. So, yeah. So maybe like come up with a more specific structure for educational work so that they can deploy it. Yeah, possibly. I, I think that would be good, although it's really hard, you know, a lot of people have ideas about what we should do with education, and it's really hard to change education, you know, because the system is, you know, the system is very entrenched, and um, it's, it's nice to think we can and we, maybe we should, uh, I think the research is showing now that we're, our kids are, in the U.S. are um, falling behind on creativity. And that's the first time that's happened in a long time. And so I think maybe that is going to scare people into thinking that we need to finally take this industrial revolution school system we have, which was really invented for a different time, you know, and, uh, and think about, you know, some changes to it. 
but it's going to be hard. Let's just do one more, and then if people can go up and ask some questions, or they can get it outside. Okay. Someone have one more? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, in your research and talking to people, if, if you touch on the top of creating a culture of design thinking or innovation, almost like grassroots style, because um, you know I've read a ton of design thinking uh, yeah. books, and then um, you know once an individual is like, yes, you know what 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 is what can we do to sort of influence others around us to that same sort of thinking and almost create a well, business or a group around. Yeah. Doing I think, uh, to me, one of the key things is the language that's used, uh, and that's why I, was, I talked a lot about the language that's used to describe it. Um, and, and, you know, the language I've come up with here is pretty simple, and I'm not suggesting that that's the only way to talk about design thinking, but I am saying that the way it's being talked about is not very good right now uh, by, you know, by the academic world and by the design world. Um, it's really it's jargony, and it's really clunky. It's like that definition I read at the beginning. Um, there's a lot of discussion of design thinking right now that if you're not really steeped in it, you get turned off by it. As soon as you see the language and the way it's being talked about, you just kind of go, it kind of puts a distance. So I think the first thing that to encourage design thinking, and th there's a lot of people who are behind this now and think it's a really important thing. And I think in order for them to push it forward into the mainstream and get more people excited about it, the first thing they have to do is clarify it and, and make it accessible to people. And once you kind of understand it, it is exciting and it's interesting. And you can see all kinds of possibilities, but you have to get past that barrier that people have of like saying, this is not for me, this is for some design techie, or this is for some college professor or whatever, it doesn't relate to my world. So I think that's the first thing is overcoming that and then, uh, then you go from there. And I think once people get excited about it, they will form their own communities and their own cultures around it. And, you know, and then, then it'll start to spread in companies and elsewhere. It already is. I mean, a lot of companies are embracing it. But I think it, it's a small, small universe of companies that are even talking about this. And uh, there's plenty of room for other companies to get on board if it becomes accessible to them. So, Thank you. good. Okay, thanks.